Thank you so much, Jerry. I really appreciate it. Unfortunately, Jerry has a three our class to teach right about now. Apparently it's a busy time of the school year, but I uh, really appreciate your, your being here and your, where are you going? <laughs> oh, thank you. So thanks thank very you. much. Thank you. Um, we have a second keynote this morning, and um, I think you'll find it a little bit different. I'm really looking forward to, uh, to this talk. This is Raymond Sewell, and um, Raymond is a professor of indigenous literature and culture. Um, he's also a uh, recording artist and a writer. Raymond's work explores lexicon and storytelling. He also serves as a Mi'kmaq advisor for various Nova Scotia Museum uh, projects, including a new exhibition at the Museum of Natural History called Epchilasi, which means, as you probably all know now, means welcome. So please help me welcome uh, Epchilasi to Raymond Suell, who will be our, our next keynote. I have a really long name now. I'm on my third cycle, so I go by Raymond Sewell is, uh, is my other name. I'm very pleased to be here today at such an important time with Truth and Reconciliation and things going on in the discussion around that in museums. I just love museums. I work at the, the university. I teach uh, English and Indigenous culture, English literature, poetry, different things like that. Uh, being here today is really special because I get to share stories from back home. You'll see my, uh, my slide here says Sibul, that means rivers, Gwispamol, that means uh, lakes, and Khan, the ocean, Nimuejuk Khan. These are Winpegajuik narratives that I'm sharing today. Uh, we talked about diversity in indigenous communities and not, them not all being uniform uh, thinking groups. Well, we have a different way of thinking on the Winpegajuik River. Uh, Winpei is our goddess. Uh, she's, she's been portrayed uh, in different mythologies as someone who's troublesome to Gluce Cap, our demigod arts and crafts. Uh, but I'd argue in our area, we're of the river, of, of Winpei's river. Winka Mitsit just means that someone's a little bit contrary, so not necessarily all good or all bad. <laughs> so I'd like to song, uh, start with a song on my dukuma desk or my drum. You'll see the uh, double curve motif here, which is common in our artwork. And you'll see the whale tail. Uh, we're of the, of the uh, oceans, rivers, and lakes where I am. I'm from Winpegajuik. Uh, the colonial name is Pavano, outside of the Bathurst region. So I'll start with a little song we sing on the river. <laughs> Nadagama sian chachi kasides. Nadagama sian chachi kasides. Nadagama sian chachi kasides. Nadagama sian chachi kasides. Hey, 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 hey. Nadagama sian chachi kasides. Nadagamasian, 
था हो So that's the whale song, Buddha Gede Begya. We play that, you know, it gets us up and moving, you know. I remember playing that uh, before the uh, before the summer school, before school is out for the summer for my wife's uh, little ones, and she teaches uh, in uh, elementary. And they said, "Stop playing the whale song at your presentations. We can't calm them down after." <laughs> that's our real get up and go song. Imagine in my region, 600 people singing that song on the beach. It was recorded. My dad rescued it uh, from a historical document. Explorers were traveling, and they said there were 600 uh, people there tapping birch bark uh, to that rhythm. And it's an acceleriano. It, it speeds up till you can't uh, do it anymore. We sing it during the holidays, at Christmas, and that in our kitchen parties, and we have good fun with it. It's like a competition song. Uh, but that song's important because it taught me a lot of things. Na dagamasian jeji gasi des. It's a transformation song. Na dagamasian. I'm traveling over the water. Jeji gasi des. I travel over Minigu or the island, and on the other side, it becomes something different. So it's the Budap Diam song. Uh, they say that you never see an old dead moose in the woods. Yap is our word for old dead moose. Where are they all going? They travel out across the water, over the island, and become a whale. So this is one of our myths back home. But it teaches me many things. Um, when I started playing it, it has a rhythm. That's the rhythm that we roll with. It teaches me about gender. Uh, my father said, "In in Guiden the canoe, uh, your genders are Genum the rower or Ebit the one who's sitting." So, it it play it. We didn't really have the concepts of gender that we have now. We had different concepts and takes on that. Uh, it also teaches me about time. Uh, we play around with the time in the song. My father said, and Nedwalk Elder say. Uh, to show that time is is a social construct as well for us, uh, we have a different way of viewing time. So, like I said, I'm from Winnipeg, Jewick. I uh, was able to go out for about seven hours. Uh, my mom watched the kids and and their aunties, and I got these pictures. Uh, this is the Nipisquit River where I'm from. It's so uh, so beautiful to be back home with the sun shining, and just to show you uh, these rivers that mean everything to me uh, in my life. Now, if I can figure out how to switch, green. Okay, wait. Okay, water and consent, uh, matriarchs, river offerings, and uh, place of water in my community. What I find really cool, like I mentioned before, is we're of the Winnipegajewik, the water where uh, Winpe is our goddess, and at uh, at every time we go to the river to swim or to canoe or things like that. We ask the river for consent. We put tobacco down, prayers up. So Dumwe is our word for tobacco. We put tobacco down. We say, hey, we know this river uh, takes lives. It's a very rough current and things like that. Uh, and just we're entering the river, uh, practicing Nedukulim. Nedukulim is our understanding of conservation. We don't take more than we need. Uh, so that's a commitment in putting that tobacco down, uh, that your prayers are suited my art to the river, and that your intentions are good. So water and consent is very important for my people where I'm from, uh, in Winnipegajewik. Uh, the other thing is the place of water in my community. I'm part of the Audible Indigenous uh, Writers Circle recently, and I've been talking with colleagues like Richard Van Camp, who talked to elders and said, um, water has a, a high place in our community. I know where I'm from. Uh, if we have Budai or a, a bottle and we put some going in it, that bottle becomes alive. Uh, in other areas, uh, they're saying keep water. Uh, level to people and hold it in a high place because it's part of your life. It's part of the community. Uh, so that's how intense the uh, relationship with water is and the reverence for water. Other things you learn from uh, poets like Natalie Diaz, Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, she says water is part of her relationship with her spouse. Uh, she can't have that without water, so <laughs> water is very important. So it's really cool concepts and just different ways of thinking about water and things like that. And this uh, this is such a beautiful picture I took. Uh, it's just a little upstream from Nipissequit uh, Falls, where it's the end for electrical uh, use. Later, you'll see some pictures of uh, some upland homes in the region. Uh, but just just to say, you can get these perfect pictures, like a painting, and just to the a little to the left, there's the industry affects it. So, yeah. Importance of travel. This is really key for me. Uh, I like to talk about the importance of travel. Growing up, we would travel everywhere. I would hear stories from Nedewak or the elders that they would go community to community to community, 
uh, in canoes before, and at different times of the year, people would show up from Abiquit or PEI to our region. Uh, people would mix and socialize and have Maui Donich gatherings. Uh, they'd come together, there'd be marriages, there'd be celebrations, different things like that. Uh, there'd be council held. Well, this transition in the 90s to me, uh, being in a car, making it on fumes desk is only with my father, you know. Uh, having very little uh, at the time, we, we ride the highs and lows uh, in the gig economy. My father was very much part of the gig economy. Uh, but we always had a, an importance for travel. We travel everywhere, uh, following these rivers to different communities, following uh, out to these areas, and doing a skill share. Uh, we learn a lot about uh, doing crafts and different things. So travel in rivers is always important. In my area, it started out with traveling on rivers, and then the technology of the train came, so that was like a new internet. People were getting to town faster. Um, I don't know how many times my, my parents said, you know, they went to town, saw a show, had a meal for a quarter. <laughs> it was kind of like they got on the train, 10 cents, the 5 cents for the show and things like that. But they got to town, they had their news, they met other people, uh, they sold baskets and, and different wares um, and, and survived. So travel is very important, that's why rivers and, and oceans and lakes are important. Here I have storytelling past and present. This is an area called Sabogal and the water's flown over the uh, bedrock there. Um, it's, this, this, these areas are backdrops for Turtle Island Pantheon. Uh, what I mean by that is there's diverse uh, Pantheon here. We have our own gods, our own stories, our own mythology linked to all these sites. Uh, so storytelling for me is about past and present. I uh, grew up with my elders telling me stories, Nedewak telling me stories, Adukwak, and I'm always hearing a story over and over, told in different ways. Um, the stories are, are very historic, but also very contemporary. Uh, because when it goes from person to person, you embellish it a little bit or, or change it a little bit to be relevant for your zeitgeist or your time. Um, so your poems and, and your stories are, are all derivative, but they're also very new. So uh, you were, the uh, keynote was talking about uh, being stuck in a time. Our stories aren't stuck in a time. We're always fighting for them to be modern because uh, we realize the importance of this not becoming a footnote in history. So opulence and accessibility of medicines. Uh, in Bison's our word for medicines. Uh, you'll see up in, the, uh, in my top left, that's by the hydro dam. That's an opulent home, uh, very secluded, very hard to get to. Uh, you'll see 1910, I have uh, Field and Stream was up in that Savogal uh, region that, where I showed you the bedrock on the previous slide. Um, this has been a playground for, for a lot of people. Um, and this is where all our stories take place. You see an executive log cabin on the Pisiguit River uh, that you can rent out at, on Airbnb site. These are all well and fine, but it, they're in the way of a lot of uh, accessibility to the river and to our medicines. So if I want to get sweet grass, there's an area I go to uh, by the beach there, uh, down by Shalor Bay. I have to ask permission from the landowner, can I go? My father had per permission, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, his children have permission. So there's a negotiation there. Uh, Sweetgrass is used in our smudge and different, uh, different ceremonies. Uh, fishing areas uh, are, are often uh, have camps or re areas that aren't accessible or a private property. Uh, so for me to do these pictures, it took about seven hours because I would have to go in and walk down in some areas and different things. Uh, other medicines on the river are berries and there's eel pools. Eel's a very uh, common meal there. Uh, salmon pools and things like that. Uh, but it brought a, a question to me about um, accessibility and whenever I think about being back home, I uh, talk with people, I said, can you just go get medicines? They said, no, it's not as easy as it was once before uh, the river became commercial and, and, and up for sports and that. Uh, so Savogal, that's, uh, that's that river uh, where they're fishing. And uh, I'll also look at other issues here. I was inspired by uh, the picture of the uh, buffaloes that were hunted by the sharpshooters and that big pile of buffalo skulls uh, that, that's available online. I looked here and saw the, uh, the impact of industry on a high level uh, on the areas where I'm from. And you can see the large piles on my left of uh, these are all trees, and these aren't small uh, twigs. Uh, this is very large trees. This is the river that, uh, that I showed you. These were going down that river. Um, in the bottom, you'll see uh, where the sturgeon was, where we would eat sturgeon. The sturgeon are no longer there uh, because of the milling activity. Up, 
up the ways uh, where I'm from, Gigwapsko, because at the falls, the seals used to go up there, the elders said. The seals stopped going after the industry showed up. Uh, so the effects are, are quite profound. Uh, now with uh, the mill closing, the land is returning back uh, slowly. You know, there's still these megalith uh, concrete structures that everyone's arguing who's going to pay to clean up. Uh, but those are, are slowly crumbling and, and nature's uh, coming back, uh, reclaiming it. Um, in the middle, you'll see uh, this is a place called the Bald Cap Mountains. Uh, this is part of that uh, long journey I did. I shouldn't have did it with a car. I was, <laughs> I was going there on these logging roads with a car. Uh, there's a four-lane dirt road that slowly goes down to just like a trickle, like a creek. Uh, and I, I kept going further and further, and I said, this isn't good. And I said, well, I need the pictures. And <laughs> so I was, and I was just wearing sandals, and I didn't want to do a 20-hour walk back. <laughs> but this is uh, up there. I sit sitting right up there, uh, if I can get to that area, because I just like to see the mountains. They say the mountains are teachers. They hold stories gunda or rocks, sit on them long enough on the story rock and you'll dream, you'll come up with uh, poetry and stuff like that and it works uh, fine in solace uh, but these areas are being clear cut as well so there's a large effect uh, on the area and then the sports fishery, um, my grandparents uh, were part of that industry, they would be guides on the Miramichi River for uh, Bulamu or salmon fishing uh, so I always like to talk about uh, those issues and how they directly affect me I remember the mill closed and I left and I came to university in 2003 and I've been here ever since more or less. I return home and more and more is degraded, more and more is, uh, of nature is debased and cut down. Uh, and it's really quite tragic because these backgrounds I thought would live forever, the backgrounds to my pantheon, uh, to our stories, how to go out into the poetry are, uh, are going away. So it's quite dire. So here's a picture of uh, another area back home. I was taught, let's tell stories uh, for the next generation. So that's my main focus right now, uh, continuing these stories, making them modern, making them relevant um, and, and accessible uh, to, to people looking for stories about the land. So there's, everywhere you go there, there's a, a, like a painting. I say I grew up in a painting. I grew up in a musical. Out on this river, we would play songs every day. Uh, we were all, everyone was always singing at me, and I find that quite odd when I moved here because <laughs> I got a little reprieve from that. Uh, but we had a song for everything. There's songs on the river. Uh, they're just saying, Glue's Cap's looking at the fish. Nemich uh, Nemik, uh, he's looking at the fish, and they keep singing that. And you're like, why are they singing that? Because it's all interlaced uh, into the land, the stories, the pantheon. The story for everything. Out west, my friend has a story for throwing a saddle on a horse and then a story for taking it off. So. It's, a, it's all done through singing and storytelling and transmission uh, through repetition. And it sticks uh, because one, like my father died uh, last March uh, or the March before and I was, the train wheels were off, I just remembered the stories. I went on autopilot, I was told them so much. And uh, I'll share the presentation too so people can see the link of the motifs I created with the stores. Um, but I wanted to end on a note, like say, well, Aliak, thanks everybody. I wanted to talk about uh, the importance of cultural imaginings. Uh, I was sitting on the waterfront here uh, in, in Tourist Central, like, like we know, and I was having my cow's ice cream with my kids, and then I had my raspberry cordial. And for a minute, I couldn't find myself as a Mi'kmaq person here. I was like caught up in this taste, this raspberry soda. I was. I was like, <laughs> you know, and then it dug into my mind, okay, what can I dig up on Abogood or PEI about Mi'kmaq? I know Mi'kmaq, where I'm from, and there's a, it's diverse. I find a lot of times competing cultural imaginings, they can seem benign, but they can totally erase a, another uh, history in that. So they are quite dangerous. Uh, if you look at, at the works, like I said, Anna Green Gables and things like that, uh, kind of were non-existent, if not... Uh, like fetishized or talked about as a footnote. Uh, but other than that, we're kind of a race from that area. Uh, so a lot of my work is about uh, reinforcing local narratives in the place uh, that we're at. I can't do them all across Mi'kma'ki, so I'm focusing uh, where I'm from. Uh, but it's always a competing um, imaginations of the region. I was talking with Kent Monkman once, and he said that we were out to dinner. He said colonization was more than just um, physical, it was also in the story realm. The sky gods were colonized. Uh, where we had Mekong Wesu or Jenu or, or different giants, different people, Wigladamuch, 
all our, our Pantheon, Javichkom, and things like that were erased and something else uh, was put in. Uh, and you even see it in our lexicon, our local lexicon. We have words like Ansel, Angel, uh, starting to creep in, and, and we're losing uh, our, our figures in the, in the Pantheon. Uh, so I'm always mindful of that. And our traditional encampment back home uh, is, is really guarded now. Um, I toured it by golf cart. It costs about $150 you can get out. Where we traditionally are, the luck of the our encampment was, is now Gallen, Gallen Bray Golf Course. We have to pay to access it. We have to dress civilly. We have, I'm just buying the fees to get on the beach to check out where we used to be. Um, they, are, they always try and keep it out of land claims and things like that. Uh, but tourism and things have definitely affected the uh, area. So my poetry, in conclusion, is about the land. I lend my talents to whatever uh, things I can. We have a film coming out uh, about Roger Augustine's life called You Can Call Me Roger. I took uh, and did about 40 minutes of traditional songs in a contemporary way. Uh, for this, we got quite creative in the studio. We thought, what if the ancestors were here? They wouldn't just uh, play drums. They would pick up guitars. They would pick up synthesizers, vocorders, and different things. So we made something really cool uh, of that flavor, but very modern. So the work is its very important to do these kind of things. And I'm glad that you had me here because uh, for the International Congress of Maritime Museums, uh, we're looking at a different way, like the previous uh, speaker mentioned. We're looking at a new way of looking at things. Uh, building a new history, they talked about fabric uh, together with inclusion and things like that and not just uh, having people separated in different pockets. Uh, one of the things I learned from my elders is Gisok, the creator, is the one that made us and they made y'all as well so we got to work together and uh, nobody owns the land, we all share uh, in, the, in, the, in the conservation of the land, that's part of the uh, So thank you for your time and uh, I'll have any questions or... Thank you, Raymond. Um, I, I, that was a, that was beautiful and wonderful, and and your drumming and singing was also just wow. I did see Kristen with a hand up, so. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, Kristen Greenaway, Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum in Maryland. Uh, I hope this is not disrespectful, but could you please explain why tobacco? Yeah. Thank uh, you. Tobacco is one of the medicines that we use uh, in the smudge. Um, modernly, we use sage, tobacco, uh, sweet grass, and, uh, and other medicines. In the past, we used birch polypore, different things. Uh, we put tobacco, I was told by Nidawak or the elders, it's part of a, you can think of it like a currency. The spirits can't have access to it, so Creator gave it to us and we give it to them to replace things. So as part of the Nedukalim, if I go out and hunt, I put down tobacco uh, for the animal that I slayed. I say prayers, I'll sit the mugging to that animal. I, re I use every part of the animal and treat it with respect. Uh, if I cut sweet grass, I cut it with my, the end of my fingernails. I don't pull it out, so I, I leave the roots. I give tobacco in that place. If I'm building a sweat lodge, I cut down the little saplings, give tobacco. It's part of... Uh, Sort of metaphorically, it, it keeps you like um, in touch with don't take more than you need and, and always give offering to things. Uh, so when we saw the trees, for example, uh, that were cut down, nobody got that much tobacco like to give, <laughs> you know. So it keeps things, it keeps us humble. That's, uh, that's why tobacco, yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, do we have some other questions? Um, Raymond, I was wondering, um, you mentioned in your introduction, and I introduced as well, that you, you teach Indigenous studies, and um, I'm curious about who are the students what, 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 that are coming to take those courses, and what, um, what are you hoping that they take out of it, or what are they surprised at what they take out of it? Can you just speak a little bit about the interest at the university of the students participating in your courses? Sure, yeah. I teach a course on literature and the environment. So I look at Homestead Acts, I look at the Indian Act uh, as literature to, to control the, uh, the land. I look at poetry and different things like that. Students come to the class are from all different backgrounds. Uh, some people have to take it, some people take it as an elective. 
uh, I'd have to say, to bring the message to you, I'm very encouraged. The students are way more prepared than, than I was when I was going through. Uh, they're more engaged politically. There's a social revolution. They're very uh, keen to learn. They're very keen to share perspectives. Uh, so I teach with the Bell Hooks uh, classroom sort of uh, as uh, transgression pedagogy. So I don't claim to know any more than them. We're all bringing our stories and narratives uh, to a higher understanding. So it kind of blends well. Uh, if you think of Edouard or two, I'd seen, I use Bell Hooks' approach uh, in traditional talking circles and that. But everyone's bringing narratives uh, to the classroom and, and they feel validated telling their stories. Uh, so the engagement levels went up. Uh, the students are leaving with a reverence uh, for the environment that they didn't have before. Uh, some of them are saying, you know, I never looked at, at it. We have teachings where we're not above anything else in nature. We teach in the circle. And uh, they say, well, that's very good. Like they can ground themselves in nature. They can write in nature now. Uh, they see it in a, in a different light as opposed to something that can just be extracted uh, infinitely. <laughs> Thank you. I think Peter has a question. Yeah. Yes, no? So, uh, just quickly, what's the status of your language in terms of your generation and the, and the generation that's following? Yeah, um, for myself, uh, I grew up with my father speaking Mi'kmaq and my mother speaking uh, English, and then I went to school to learn French. I mastered both the colonial languages. Uh, the Mi'kmaq wasn't cool. Uh, you know, I was competing with MTV, you know. It, uh, growing up, I wanted to be a rock star. That's why I moved here. I want to, you know, be part. Uh, so it's really, really hard to, to promote. Uh, but then it kind of broke. Uh, like my friend Jeremy Dutcher said, uh, it wasn't that it's dying. It wasn't allowed to exist. Uh, now that it's allowed to exist, I teach my daughter Millie Dow, that means hummingbird, and Geonic Otter. Uh, they just speak it at McDonald's. Uh, when we were young, that would kind of be socially policed by people. They, they would treat us as other or different. The kids are really on a bash now, so it's really encouraging. And I find there's a real uptick in it. Uh, for the longest time, it, it was been propagated that the language was so hard to learn. It would take 13 years to learn discussion and things like that. Uh, but I worked with my elders, and I'm reclaiming my language by just falling back into it. This is, it's based in Proto-Algonquin. It's not based in Latin, so don't try and, it's free word association. Just fall back into it. Just speak it. Let it happen. Uh, we, we, we just speak it. And uh, I'd say it's really encouraging right now, uh, but it, it did go down to, like, very few speakers. So, yeah, thanks for that question, yeah. Thanks. Um, Eric Ruff? Thank you. And just the other day, I heard on the radio, um, and finally, I think, understand two eyes seeing. Could you explain that? I think a lot of people here won't won't know that, and I think it's important. Thank sure, you. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, from the way I understand it, it's like uh, seeing in stereo, figuratively. Uh, you look with a Western paradigm and you look with an Elnu or Skiji Elnu and a Mi'kmaq paradigm and you sort of blend the two, the best medicines is what they call it, or both. Uh, so in terms of health, uh, we know there's so much good medicine uh, that comes with healing people. Uh, we use that medicine, we're grateful for that, that medicine uh, from that paradigm. Uh, and, but we use our local stuff too. Uh, so it's important to see things through different... Uh, the best way I describe it, and this is just me personally, this is Albert Marshall's theory. But Edouard for me, is uh, the elders say, if you, you go somewhere and you see a tree, for example, or you see a forest or a mountain or something, you don't know, you can't say you know it or, or, or that until you go around and see it from all different angles. So it's about inclusion at different points in that circle of different uh, people's narratives and truths and that to a higher understanding. Uh, so the Mi'kmaq language is part of that for me, uh, French language, um, English, all, all the languages that I encounter, I just love them as tools for understanding. Uh, so I don't get hung up on, on those things. I'm open to new understandings. Our language holds all our philosophies and worldviews in that. Uh, the more I look into the language, the more I study the morphemes of it, the more I study prefix, suffix, affix, lexicons, things like that, the, the more I'm saying, wow, you know, this, this is a word that we don't even have in English. This is so cool. An example is that uh, I was talking with uh, uh, I was talking with an El linguist, and I say, "What's this word delegadut? Delegadut is based on inflection, 
Uh, so a delegate could be that person's about to smile, that person's really mad. Depending on how you say it with the inflection uh, out on the land, you know that person's emotion. And I didn't know too much of that in English. It's kind of like a pre-emotion or something. So if I see you, you're very pleasant. I'm like, delegate. But if you're mad, hey, delegate. You know, kind of. So we got these cool nuances and, and things uh, in the language uh, that open up my understanding in different ways. Uh, and it's very cool. Like uh, I love being a part of that. So. Thank That's you. Jackie? Hi, I'm Jackie Watson. I'm from Melbourne, and I'm very interested in drawing parallels between your Indigenous culture and what I perceive to be happening in Australia at the moment. And I'm, I'm curious, I read somewhere that if you really want to destroy a culture, you take the language and you take the children. And that certainly happened in Australia, and it sounds like it happened in Canada too. I'm interested in returning one of those powerful mechanisms, which is language, at an earlier level than you describe. Are children taught in primary school, or is that not part of your culture? Yeah. To have language taught formally in that way. Sure, yeah. A lot of... Uh a lot of students are, are learning the language uh, from home uh, and from apps now uh, and from school boards like Mi'kmaq and the way they teach it uh, in the language. I can say the recovery is really good because you have a lot of speakers coming from the MMK schools. They're doing excellent work. Uh, people are fluent in the language. Uh, it's cool because it's a, it's a modern form of language. My father spoke an older form uh, and he called it abaktagwaj. Uh, they're adding too much uh, seagull to it which means too much uh, like uh, out, outside from the ocean uh, words because the nouns are often uh, just incorporated into the language because uh, it's a verb-based language. Uh, so, for example, a person plays or thing. So we'd have like uh, Subway, we, we would put iktuk on the end. Are you going to Subway iktuk? Uh, so <laughs> we'd borrow a lot of French and English words. Uh, where we're from, they call that Gespeg, uh, speaking like a higher uh, version because you're incorporating more words. Uh, to me, that says it's pretty cool because it looks at the power of language and, and for us to napadastic uh, entangle uh, the power of other languages in ours is, is a cool concept. Uh, but at that level, there is an appetite and people are, are being trained uh, in the language. So they also have uh, Mi'kmaq Gananawe has a mentorship program. I think it's about 400 hours where they're making speakers, they're making uh, lecturers and teachers. So every effort's being made to preserve the language because uh, the idioms and the worldviews are so necessary to describe the, the land where the nomenclature for here. So every, everything has been about language revival. Uh, when I was younger, my father kept speaking the language, and although I wasn't listening at that time, I have the toolkit uh, for the, to, to make the sounds and, that, and to read and write in it. So uh, all those language efforts, uh, they existed first, uh, outside of uh, academia, but now they're being incorporated in school systems and that. So, yeah, for the longest time, it was like guerrilla language revival. Like, <laughs> it was quite dire, and uh, now it's being recognized. The, the kids are speaking it more, which is cool, yeah. Raymond, uh, last evening, uh, Catherine Martin did a Mi'kmaq, traditional Mi'kmaq welcome for us at the Maritime Museum, and she, like you, brought the drum. Would you mind just telling a little bit about the drum, the significance of the drum? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so this is Dugamadesk, or the drum. We call it Dugamadesk. It makes a sound of thunder. Uh, that's what we call it in Winnipegjewik. There's different names. Um, you might say Njigamak and the ash. Uh, I call it the Mi'kmaq tambourine. Uh, that's another instrument that we play a lot. Uh, that's, that means you're rapping on something, Njigamak. Uh, but Dugumades is a thundering sound. Uh, this is sino stretched over um, ash or pine or different uh, woods. Mine's quite complex with the handle. I go around on tour a lot, so I need one that I can count on. Um, this is deer hide, this one. Uh, I have ones made out of buffalo. I have ones made out of moose uh, and different things. Uh, we use bear grease on them in a circular motion, just a pea-sized amount to keep them hydrated. Uh, the drum is considered a person in my culture. Uh, in my local area, so it's treated with respect. It's never brought around drugs and alcohol. People have different teachings, uh, but in our house, uh, we don't really hang them up. We don't put them in the in a shadow box or that. They're always ready to be played. The coolest thing about them is, uh, like, I'll sit this down, 
And if I'm with people that aren't from the community, my kid will come or their kid will come pick it up, start hitting it, and they'll say, hey, no, no, watch. It's, it's meant to be played. Uh, they say all the drums are awakened by children and they should be able to be played. That's, that tells you something about us wanting to, our culture to continue on. Everything's accessible in the culture. Everything here uh, returns to the earth. So when there's a hole in this drum, the spirit left it. It's no longer alive uh, and everything goes back uh, to the woods and back to the earth. Uh, but the drum's been such a key friend. I've traveled all over America and, and here with it. I've been able to play. I've been able to engage in the community storytelling that all based around the drum. So the drum's uh, pretty much everything. Like, yeah. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, Jerry Lund from the Maritime Museum. I'm uh, fascinated uh, you uh, raised Jeremy Dutcher's name. Is he not the... Uh, historian and singer who won the Polaris Prize a few years ago uh, based on research he did in audiophiles in New Brunswick. Yeah. Could you, could you, are you, I, I know you're well acquainted with this project. Could you just touch on what he did? I'm yeah. very interested to see the really rather old recordings brought, brought to the fore and become new again. Yes, of course. A lot of my contemporaries, uh, Jordan Bennett as well, um, Jeremy Dutcher sat with the Wax Cylinders, a musicologist, of course. Um, Jeremy Dutcher did an exhibit here for the, the Museum of uh, Natural History, uh, sitting with birch bark baskets and his response. Uh, I know others like Ursula Johnson did museum work uh, on basket making. She has an exhibit, if I want you all to check it out, called Opal Deck. It means that basket's not quite right, taking utilitarian things into another discussion. Uh, that's that's very important to bring up. It's it's not exactly a, cam, a camarada of people, but there's a, a shared understanding of the culture and, and the modernity of it, and bringing back these conversations with old things. Uh, what I mean by that uh, is, if I'm at the museum, uh, some people see it as an artifact, but I see it as material culture. Uh, a lot of these items, uh, for instance, like a, a pipe, if the stem and the and the the pipe are together, it's in ceremony because those are locked. Uh, if I see something uh, like my drum and it's not broken, the spirit's in it. These things are alive to us, uh, so we like to sit with them and have conversation. It, it's, it's metaphorical in a way, but to, to be informed by the past and make art that's derivative from the past and doesn't deviate from it too much. Uh, so what I mean by that is when I'm doing uh, poetry or, or writing a song or doing some kind of work on something, I go to my elders or Nedewak and I say, hey, what do you think about this? I go to knowledge keepers. Am I taking the culture in the right direction? Uh, because it's a community mind. It's, it's not hyper-individualism. Uh, so I, I'm always mindful of where I'm taking the community too. I uh, vet that very much uh, in, like an academic process. And they say, no, it's not quite right. Uh, do it again. I know that uh, Jeremy worked with Maggie on this process back and forth, back and forth, until you feel it's something that's represented a community. Uh, so where I'm from, there's no copyright. Uh, we're all, we all have the, the colors uh, to us from the cultural booty that we can paint new pictures with, uh, but we have a responsibility uh, to our community to take it in the right direction. So when I was young, I'd do all kinds of foolish stuff, make all kinds of foolish art, and bring it to my elders, and they say, no, that's not quite all new, try again. Uh, and through that process, I've learned to, uh, Learn to refine the things and, and carry them out uh, in a way that we're happy and proud of. So, yeah, that's a great question uh, about making art and stuff like that. And it brings these things out of the museum uh, to their intended purpose. Like I talked about our views of time. Uh, we don't have the concept of time where I'm from. My, my dad said, Dasajit just means how far the sundial moved, uh, how much it clicked. Uh, but in terms of time, uh, we, we, we see it different. So to, to bring those uh, things into your art as well. So all those conversations and philosophies uh, get bundled up with that, vet it, and then come out the other end. That's part of what happens in that black box when you come with creativity and then finished products. They're important conversations. <laughs> oh, sorry. I thought we, had, we have another one last question from Richard. Uh, hi, I very much appreciate your uh, talk. Um, a lot of museums um, engage in this idea of dual storytelling. So we're talking about Captain Cook. You, you have the view from the ship and the view from the shore. But I just wanted your opinion whether, in fact, this sort of dual approach to a wide audience is the best approach or perhaps a more singular view of, on an event rather than trying to accommodate 
two sets of ideas. So I wonder if you could speculate. Sure, yeah. Uh, well, when we're, whenever we're presenting something, I know with Meg, uh, Meg is the museum advisory group, we're working on the new exhibit uh, of Mi'kmaq uh, material culture. Uh, we brought diverse opinions to show the diversity that exists uh, within Mi'kmaq. So we have people from Cape Breton, people from mainland Nova Scotia, myself from New Brunswick, different areas. And a lot of those stories are included. Whenever we were coming up with concepts, we weren't thinking linear. We are talking about the story from where, where you are. So we share different perspectives. Uh, and I, can, I know what you mean about, like, if you have the example of uh, Cook, was it? Uh, you present it a certain way. Uh, for Mi'kmaq people, we present it different ways, tell the story different ways, but that's okay because there's diverse opinions sort of thing. Uh, and we're very diverse. I, I have to admit we have Trump supporters in Mi'kmaq. Uh, you know, so there's, it's a large spectrum, uh, but it, it's, it's that diversity that makes the story more rich for us. Uh, so a lot of, in my culture, we have this humility where we hear other people too. Uh, you often hear that. And... Um, and we make sure we incorporate our people's opinions. Uh, there was talk about uh, exhibits and then working with people and then them not having a unified uh, opinion. That's something where we work on actively for decolonization, to have all different kinds of opinions and make sure that they're validated and matter in that space. Uh, so we, we might have less content in terms of, of digestible uh, sections of an exhibit, uh, but more in-depth story about the things that we really want to place front and center kind of thing, yeah. And stories are like, uh, sort of like my presentation style. We just tell a bunch of stories. Uh, you take with, with that what you will and you leave the rest behind. That's our traditional teaching method. So, yeah, and we're hoping those sidebars happen, like if you're at an exhibit uh, with interpreters and things and talking about, it. yeah. So thanks, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Raymond. Uh, that, was, that was wonderful. Thank you.